Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for our International Compost Awareness Week webinar. Today's webinar is on compost as a climate solution. I'm Natasha Duarte, the director of the Composting Association of Vermont. I'd like to start with just a little bit of background on the Composting Association of Vermont for those of you who are not familiar with our organization. We were founded in 2002. We believe that increasing the use of compost in our communities improves soil health, water quality, and our collective resilience to climate change. We try to move this forward, advancing production and use of compost is vital to soil health. And we just demonstrate the value of compost through education, outreach, and policy initiatives. We're a small nonprofit located in Hinesburg, Vermont. We are a member organization. Our members are primarily made up of Vermont solid waste management entities, policymakers, practitioners, educators, and concerned citizens. This webinar series is part of the 25th Annual International Compost Awareness Week, a program run in the U.S. by the Composting Council Research and Education Foundation. The theme this year is Soil Loves Compost. And one of the goals is really to uh, try to reach as many people and engage as many people as possible. So if you are on social media and you would like to share, here are the hashtags that are being used to promote this International Compost Awareness Week. Just a quick promo after this webinar that we're in right now, we do have one more uh, installment that's actually part of Prescott College's Food System Friday webinar series about composting for your garden in the time of COVID-19. Wendy Sue Harper, who is one of the CAV board members and myself are two of the panelists on that. So you can hop over if you haven't seen uh, the details to the CAV website and register for that still. And that starts at three o'clock this afternoon. I'd like to give big thanks to all of our ICAW sponsors, the Addison County Solid Waste Management District, Community Bank, Nature Cycle, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Denmark, Rich Earth Institute, and Vermont Natural Ag Products. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Carl. We're very fortunate today to be joined by Carl Tiedemann, co-founder of Soil for Climate and co-founder of Somerville Climate Action. He serves on the board of the Somerville Community Growing Center, a quarter acre urban oasis offering artistic, cultural, and educational programming in an organic garden setting. Carl has experience in the environmental laboratory field and he has marketed electric vehicles for the company that has had its roots as MIT's solar car team. His focus is climate communications, including poetry. Carl holds a BA in chemistry from Wesleyan University. Thank you, Carl, so much for sharing your time with us today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you so we can learn more about your work. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, it's an honor to be here today. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, hello, everybody out there in the internet land. I have a background in chemistry uh, as a brief introduction and have worked in the environmental chemistry field and throughout my life have wanted to find ways to improve the planet and in improve the environment. Uh, in the past, I'd worked mostly on the, on the technology side and in, in trying to cut the emissions. And about a dozen years or so ago, I began to learn that soil, soil restoration in particular could be a very effective way of getting the carbon out of the atmosphere, as well as helping to make agriculture more resilient to droughts and, and flooding and so on. Um, for, I guess, about 25 or 30 years, I'd been a home composter and always knew that it was uh, good for the environment, but never really understood that it was also helping to mitigate climate change as well. So that was kind of an interesting discovery to make along the way. Uh, I'd like to begin with a little bit of an introduction to the nonprofit Soil for Climate that I co-founded with my friend and colleague, Seth Itzkan. We started uh, five years ago, almost exactly five years ago, and we're based here in Vermont as a 501c3. We have over 18,000 members in our Facebook group from more than 100 countries around the world. So if this is a topic that interests you and if you use Facebook, I invite you to, to join and, and participate in this conversation. As we think about the, these global issues that need to be solved, in, including climate change or, or addressed, it's important to think of the world as a whole. Uh, for too often, I think for many people and often in the media, uh, the issue of climate change comes down to a single parameter of, of carbon dioxide. And while that's certainly a, a, a very important part of climate change, there's 
much more than the story of just the atmosphere. It's the way that the atmosphere interacts with the oceans, with the land, and so on. And if all we think about is the carbon dioxide in the air, it can seem somewhat hopeless because the residence time of CO2 in the air can, can be a thousand years or so. And, um, and, and by taking steps with reforestation, with restoration of wetlands, with regenerative agriculture, including the use of compost and mulch, we can actually begin to address some of these issues. And it's important to take a holistic view. For example, in this image that we're looking at here, uh, it looks like the rain is falling on the forest, possibly, or is it the forest that's giving the mist back up to the air? Uh, it, it's hard to tell. And that's because in nature, things are cyclical. Energy is received, energy is given off, water is received, water is given off, you know, that there's a nutrient cycle as well. And, and all of these factors can help to shape our understanding of the natural systems and again, the role that they can play in, in mitigating climate change. Land restoration is an, a crucial issue because throughout the world, literally for thousands of years, uh, land has been degrading, uh, turning in, into deserts. And there's a wonderful book by the University of Washington geomorphologist David Montgomery called Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations, in which he discusses approximately 20 civilizations throughout history that failed when the soil became so degraded they could no longer feed uh, their citizens. Uh, and, um, and he describes the plow as being perhaps the most destructive implement uh, ever created by humankind. Of course, it wasn't just the plow that was contributing to this land degradation. You know, we understand now fact, other factors, including uh, deforestation, uh, burning uh, when it's not done properly, and mismanaged grazing have all contributed uh, to loss of green cover, keeping the soil healthy. This example, for example, in 1957 shows five feet of soil loss. And if one considers that soil is typically anywhere from a few percent up to 10%, 12% or more carbon, that amount of soil loss represents a tremendous amount of carbon that's been lost to the atmosphere with much of it, or lost to the environment, with much of it going into the atmosphere. Viewers may be surprised to learn, as I was, that according to a, a paper that was published in 1978 by Heinrich Bonn, B-O-H-N, uh, he described, uh, based on his research, that fossil fuels did not become the chief contributor of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere until the mid-1960s. Very often, people, when they think about climate change, they think of the rise of the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s and the beginning of large-scale uh, coal mining and so forth, and or later oil, and natural gas. But throughout all of that time frame, going back literally thousands of years, uh, the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere was greater. Uh, today, estimates are that fossil fuels account for about 80% of the carbon going into the atmosphere, uh, with the other 20, maybe 25% coming from land degradation. When land becomes very highly degraded, it can lead to pretty severe deserts and erosions, as seen in this photo uh, from the National Park Service. I would point out that the, the oxidizing plant matter in the foreground is a clue that until uh, fairly recently in historical times, this was, in fact, a very healthy and, and thriving grassland. This graph shows the very rapid rise in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases uh, that began in the, or that really began to rise, as we can see, in uh, around the year 1900. And again, I just wanted, adding on the point I made a moment ago, that much of the rise that we see throughout the 18 and 1900s actually came from soil disturbance uh, through mechanized plowing in more and more larger areas of the world being brought into uh, cultivation. In 2009, there was a, a seminal paper written by Susan Solomon, who is the co-chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and a professor of atmospheric science at MIT, in which she explained that because of how much carbon dioxide has, has gone into the atmosphere, that we were looking at a, a thousand years uh, of warming of the planet, even if, even in the event of a complete cessation of emissions. Pretty much up to this time, until about 10 years ago, uh, the thinking was, well, if we just stop uh, our emissions of fossil fuels and reduce the emissions, um, that we could bring this situation under control. But this paper showed that just stopping the emissions, although crucial, was not good enough. Uh, responding to her work, four years later, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change put out a statement 
saying exactly what she had, is that a, a large fraction of anthropogenic climate change resulting from CO2 emissions is irreversible on a multi-century to millennial time scale. But then they added a clause, except in the case of a large net removal of CO2 from the atmosphere over a sustained period. So here they were putting the world on notice to let them know that we have to take the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere also. And the question is, how do we do that? Where is it going to go? Well, an answer is provided by the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification when they declared that the potential for land to hold carbon and act as a sink for greenhouse gases is unparalleled. This is not to say that other technologies, for example, um, may not be needed as well, but land has an absolutely crucial role to play. When carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are, are given off through industrial, either fossil fuels or through agriculture, uh, there are three places where they can go. They can go either into the ocean, which causes acidification of the oceans. Uh, the gases can go into the atmosphere, which causes the warming of the planet. Or, and the only good option, is they can go back into the land to help build uh, or uh, grow more trees and more plant matter and to improve the fertility of the soil. So our goal, ultimately, is to not only reduce the emissions given off by human civilization, but to capture as much of, these, uh, of the carbon that, that we can and, and put it back into the earth to improve the fertility and to replace a lot of the carbon that's, that's been lost through historical times. For anyone who wants to delve a little deeper into this subject, there was an excellent paper in 2005 uh, by William Rudderman in Scientific American asking when did anthropogenic climate change first begin. And he puts it right back to the beginning, the dawn of agriculture, close to 10,000 years ago, when the human population, although very small in numbers, uh, began releasing tremendous amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Historically, following each ice age cycle that happened historically, and ice ages would happen roughly every 100,000 years, typically the planet would only be warm for a very short period of time, and then temperatures would fall again quite sharply. Um, but a very unusual thing, uh, completely anomalous in the history that we have going back of 800,000 years or so from the ice core records, about 10,000 years ago when the planet should have started cooling quite sharply, in fact it didn't. The temperatures maintained uh, fairly steady for the last 10,000 years, a period that's been uh, called or is called the Holocene, and it was during this 10,000 years aberration that all of human civilization, uh, for better or worse, uh, developed. And scientists had long wondered you know, what accounted for this, uh, this anomalous, warm, stable period. And based on Rudderman's work, it's become clear that in fact, early human farmers inadvertently created this very stable, warm period. Um, and of course, now the situation is, has gotten a, a bit out of hand. So how do we get the carbon out of the atmosphere? and back into the soil where it's urgently needed. Well, one of the ways that we can do it, of course, is by growing trees, which is a, a, a very important uh, part of this. Uh, but today I'm going to focus more on the agricultural side of the cropping and planting side. So we see here uh, a display, I think this was at the Botanical Garden in DC. I, I don't think it's on display there any longer, but these are actual plants uh, superimposed upon a, a photo. And we can get some idea of, of how long in, uh, the roots are of perennial grasses, so that when you look out over a prairie or a grassland, you only see about a third or one fourth of all the plant matter that's there. The greater part of the show is actually going on underground. And sometimes these roots can reach six feet, nine feet, 15 feet, even deeper underground. And this is important because uh, it gives the plants greater stability. So during dry periods, sometimes it can go six months or more without any rain. You have the roots stretched deep down that can pull water up from very far below. And more importantly, it is the roots that are actually transferring the carbon into the ground. For many years, and certainly when I was growing up, um, it was my understanding that the way the carbon got into the ground was through degradation of for example, leaves. It, you know, during the fall, the leaves would fall off the tree, settle on the ground, and then the leaves would decompose, and the carbon from the leaves would find their way into soil. And while that it does account for a small amount of the carbon going into the ground, far and away, the majority of it is 
happening through the process of photosynthesis. So in other words, when the sun shines on the plants, the plants make sugars. Some of those sugars, the plant keeps and uses to build the stalk and the stem and the leaves and so on and the roots. But in some cases, half or more of the sugars that are made by the plant are exuded or leaked through the roots into the ground. And you might ask, well, why would a plant give away half of its photosynthetic energy from the sun? Why wouldn't it keep it for itself? And the reason is it's pumping those sugars into the ground to feed the underground soil life, which in turn help the plant get all of the nutrients and the minerals that it needs. One way to think of this is a, a, a maple tree in the sap, uh, the, you know, very sweet syrupy uh, type uh, compound. So every plant makes its own particular blend of root exudates. So every different plant that you have is feeding a different community of life underground. So the more different types of plants that you can have above ground, the greater the diversity of the life below ground that's being fed. And one of the things that we've learned uh, through um, soil biology is just how important it is to have as many different types of species underground as you can. And the more different types of species that you have, the more different properties uh, can emerge. There's a, I won't get into it now, but there's a biological pheno phenomenon identified in the 1970s uh, known as quorum sensing. And the greater the number of different types of species interacting, the more, as I say, different properties and the more resilience uh, that the biological community can have. In contrast to annual plants, which tend to have very shallow roots, the perennial plants are just the champions at, at pumping carbon into the ground. And there's good research showing that a grassland, when it's grazed properly, uh, can sequester anywhere from one and a half to as much as three tons of carbon per acre per year. And if you get, begin to multiply that by the millions and billions of acres around the land, around the world where grazing takes place, then we can rapidly see that it, you know, it, it, there's a potential for humanity to be able to pull billions of tons of carbon out of the atmosphere each year. And this is crucial because right now uh, there are approximately 300 billion tons of excess carbon in the atmosphere that we have to get out. We have to get it back into the ground to restore the world's soils, to, to build up the soil carbon sponge, uh, as it were, as it's sometimes called. This is a, a slide showing some of the, the wonderful underground life, the way it all works together. Uh, I mentioned how roots actually pull up the minerals from the ground and, and the water and so forth. Uh, but one thing that the roots cannot do, for example, is to, um, if there aren't enough minerals in the ground dissolved in water, they're kind of at a loss. But fortunately, the fungi, the mycorrhizal fungi that lives in the soil can produce acids and enzymes, and it can go and etch rocks chemically to get the minerals in turn that the root needs. So there's kind of a, an exchange going on, an economy underground, where the fungi are turning over the minerals to the roots. The roots in turn are giving the sugar syrup and, and um, uh, other compounds uh, that the fungi need. And of course, many other creatures ranging from the microscopic, most, you know, which most of life underground, we can't see at all, um, up to the, the species that are, that are much more common and, and larger, you know, that we're more familiar with and so on. Uh, Dr. Elaine Ingham, was the one who coined the phrase, the, the soil food web. And she's a great teacher uh, for people who are interested in learning more about this aspect. This picture shows exactly how, again, important the deep roots are. Uh, for one thing, different plants have roots at different depths, uh, so they can feed the soil life at different depths as well. Uh, and if you notice on this image, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but in the very top left here, we have uh, typically uh, lawn grass with extremely shallow roots. So we can see that there, the grass isn't very resilient to lawn grass. It has to be uh, typically fertilized uh, and watered regularly just because its roots don't stretch down very far in comparison to some of these other plants that just have uh, stunning root structures. And uh, and what happens when we start to begin uh, pumping carbon back into the ground? Well, let me go, let me advance this slide. The more, the deeper the roots are, the more carbon it's pumping into the ground and the carbon holds the water and the soil begins uh, to become spongy and, and, and stickier and more air spaces open up in the soil that can hold more water. 
And as the soil holds more water, the aquifer uh, underground, the water table, begins to rise. So the way that we can replenish dried up rivers, you know, recharge aquifers around the world that are falling, is by restoring the plant cover on the surface. In fact, it's the only way that we can do that. And when we bring the water table up sufficiently, then surface water appears again. Rivers that have dried up or lakes that have dried up uh, can, can come back. And of course, it's, it's not just the soil and the grass, as, as I alluded to. Uh, the animals also play a crucial role in this. I won't be going into detail on this today, uh, but the proper grazing of grasslands, we now understand, is an absolutely uh, essential component to this when grass plants, uh, particularly in dry environments, are not grazed. Ultimately, they shade themselves to death. When the plant then dies, it's no longer able to pump the carbon, the, the sugar syrup into the ground. I should mention the phrase, uh, Dr. Christine Jones, a soil ecologist from Australia, has called it the liquid carbon pathway, the way the carbon is pumped into the ground. And so uh, ruminants, which first evolved along with grasslands about 40 million years ago, made their appearance on the planet, um, are just absolutely crucial. The land needs the animals just as much as the animal needs the land. This is just kind of to show the way uh, different people around the world are beginning to embrace this notion of uh, the importance of soil and in, in climate restoration. Uh, these are some terrific books on the topic. And we we're very honored back a couple of weeks ago uh, to do a live stream interview uh, with Bill McKibben in our group. And I'm happy to say that Bill McKibben, who's focused pretty ex exclusively on cutting emissions and of course on divestment, stopping pipelines and so on, uh, is also uh, beginning to speak out uh, in favor of the need for soil restoration. And as Bill McKibben notes here, he says, at best, most of the industries on the planet can be carbon neutral, but agriculture and forestry, they can be carbon negative. They can pull us in the right direction. That concludes my formal remarks. I, I do have a, a couple of things I'd like to say about the role of, of compost in particular. Uh, I mentioned earlier that when, when leaves fall on the ground, very little of the carbon in the leaves actually ends up in the soil itself. Uh, when the leaves become oxidized by the sunlight, at the ultraviolet rays of the sun shining on them and breaking them down, the carbon dioxide goes in, into the air at that point. The carbon in the leaves, when it becomes oxidized, goes into the atmosphere. Uh, in the same way, when we spread a layer of, of compost out on the field, much of the carbon in that compost will actually go into the atmosphere. But that's not to say it, it isn't important. In fact, it's, it's very important to use compost and mulch. And I, I have a couple of reasons as to how the compost helps the soil uh, sequester carbon. And uh, I'd like to go through them now. First of all, the compost shades the soil, which prevents the sun's ultraviolet rays from oxidizing any bare or exposed soil that happens to be on the surface. Second, the compost keeps the soil cooler. This creates more conducive conditions for the soil life to flourish. Third, uh, the compost layer helps keep moisture in the soil by slowing down the rate of evaporation while permitting rainwater to trickle through. Fourth, it protects the soil from compaction and erosion caused by heavy rain. And fifth, the compost provides energy in the form of carbon and nutrients in the form of minerals to feed the underground soil food web. So compost is, uh, is absolutely important for, for all of those reasons and, and possibly more that, that I'm not aware of. Uh, this is a, an image of a, a composter design that was developed by, by David Johnson, uh, a researcher at New Mexico State University, and his wife, uh, Sue Johnson, uh, together came up with this idea of what they call a compost bioreactor. Uh, essentially, uh, it's more or less a, a regular compost type of bin. Uh, this is one that they constructed uh, out of chicken wire and some agricultural fabric or mesh around it. And what's different is, they, as you can see from this photo, they have uh, approximately five or six. The number can vary depending on the construction, but in, in this case, it uh, looks like there are five or so uh, PVC pipes. Uh, there are holes that are drilled in the pipes. I'm not sure how clear that's if that can be seen or not. Uh, but essentially, the pipes are put into position. The leaves or the other matter that you want to compost is then poured around it. 
uh, within a day or two, the fungi and the compost sets up and the pipes themselves can actually be removed, leaving open air channels inside. But uh, with this design, there's no need to turn the compost because all of the compost in the bin is within just a few inches or so of a, a fresh air supply. So the mix never goes anaerobic. You can leave it. And what happens, uh, and David is a, a molecular biologist. Uh, he's done meta, meta genomic studies on the compost. Uh, what he's found is that if, he, if it's left alone for about a year, and because he's in a very dry environment, it does need to be watered regularly so it never dries out, so the biology stays active. But at the end of a year, when he's tested it, he's found that it has over 100 different types of fungi in it. So it becomes an incredibly uh, powerful tool to use in promoting soil health. And at first, when he was experimenting with this a number of years ago, he would take the compost and, um, and use it in a very different way. Normally with compost, you might spread a couple of inch layer like everywhere. Well, not with this, because here it's mostly about the biology. So he, as he describes it, he would take a handful and throw a handful over here and a handful over there and a handful over there. Very light application. In fact, I was kind of shocked to hear how little he uses. He describes about one pound per acre or about a kilogram per hectare. So uh, almost none at all, really like a sprinkling, like a salt as a garnish or something. And he found dramatically, in, by inoculating the soil biology in this way, he found dramatically improved growth. He then went on to experiment making a compost tea or, or possibly a compost extract, spraying that, saw very good results. Uh, what he's experimenting with now is, is using it to inoculate seeds so that each seed that is planted thinks that it's developing an incredibly fungal rich environment so that it expresses very well and begins growing very strong and very rapidly right from the get-go. If you're interested in his work, I would recommend uh, Googling uh, Dr. David Johnson or uh, Compost Bioreactor, and you can find some uh, terrific videos uh, of David and his wife um, talking about their research. And uh, it's being replicated now. I went to a workshop at the University of Vermont. Uh, Dr. Juan Alves and his crew, they've built several of these and they're getting uh, collecting data on it. Uh, also on it, uh, Chico State uh, University or Cal State Chico in California. Uh, Dr. Cindy Daly and her team have also constructed some and they're collecting data as well. The results from this have proven so good that uh, as in the case of many aspects of regenerative agriculture, uh, they're considered outliers at this point because the performance has been so good uh, that it really needs to be replicated before it can be accepted by the greater community. But for those of you who do work with compost, uh, it might be something to, to look into. All right, so I'll, I'll close with my remarks there and Natasha may have some questions or we can take some questions from the audience. Thank you so much, Carl, for sharing that with us. That was a, a great primer, I think. If anyone in the, if any of the participants do have questions, you can go ahead and type them into the chat and, uh, and I'll read them out for Carl so we, so we all can hear what the question is. One of the things that I've been thinking about just while people are typing in their questions, Carl, a lot of the news with the COVID-19 and stay home, stay safe, shelter in place um, that's happening around the globe, we're seeing really pretty amazing drops in emissions, at least, and changes, you know, just changes environmentally from people not driving as much, a lot of businesses being shut down. And I was just wondering if, I assume you've been following that to some extent, and I was just wondering if, if you had any comments about that and, and the, you know, both the implications and then also what we might learn as we move, you know, as we start opening back up, so to speak, post stay home, stay safe. Sure. Uh, it's been terrific to see many of the images of a clear Los Angeles or being able to see the Himalaya Mountains from 100 miles mm -hmm. away, some really absolutely beautiful striking images, uh, videos of wildlife sort of invading back into the cities again. Uh, very heartwarming to see all of that. And of course, air travel has been greatly reduced. Uh, automobile traffic has been cut way down. So there, there's definitely less use of, of fossil fuels. That being said, most of the fossil fuels that are being used, the larger sectors are for things like power generation or for mm -hmm. industrial processes. So emissions may be reduced from what I've seen possibly in the range of five to 10% or something, uh, which is important, you know, and I'm all in favor of that. Historically, it's not going to make much of a difference in our climate trajectory just because we're dealing 
with this tremendous burden that we have in the atmosphere already that's propelling things uh, in a very negative direction. So um, it means that we have to remove less carbon, slightly less carbon from the atmosphere, but it does not in any way take away from the great task uh, that we have before us. What I think the, the, the best, I hate to describe anything of a, of a pandemic being a silver lining, uh, but I hope that one positive outcome is that uh, when people do see a, a cleaner world, uh, that they, they will not be so anxious to get back into, into polluting the skies and polluting the waterways, and that there will be a new consciousness, a new sensitivity to the need to work with nature and to begin to put some of these policies and practice into place. Uh, as well, we've seen, the, we've seen the fragility of the food system um, with the shelves becoming bare, uh, with the, the distribution networks that are breaking down. Um, in many cases, it's because we're importing food from thousands of miles away across the country. Uh, probably many people watching are familiar with the Victory Gardens during World War II. In fact, uh, today is the, I heard the 75th anniversary of the ending of World War II in Europe. Um, of course, the war with Japan was still going on for several more months. But nonetheless, uh, during World War II, uh, under Eleanor Roosevelt's leadership, Victory Gardens supplied, I've heard, half or more uh, of all the produce, the vegetables that were consumed in the country. So um, that gives some potential as to, to what a mobilized population can do uh, with the correct leadership and, and with the incentive. And you know, one thing I would like to leave for you know, the folks who are watching, who are the homeowners or, or city dwellers, you may not have 100 acres or 1,000 acres of land to work with, but certainly within your gardens, you can create wildlife habitat for bees and pollinators, and you can use compost and uh, apply it on your soils as a way of improving the soil health. Uh, and there are tens of millions of acres that are used for lawns in the country that can be put into climate service uh, for humanity. And even though the, the acreage may be quite modest, uh, again, it's, it's shaping the way people think about these larger climate and environmental issues that may be the the most important impact. Yeah, thanks, Carl. And I think that's exactly right. What I've seen um, in a lot of this really positive, uh, inspiring reporting to some extent, and, and the images for sure are impactful, and, and hopefully that will move to action. But there's been noticeably absent any conversation tied to that about needing to draw down the carbon as, at the same time as reducing the emissions. So I think that's a, those were great points to bring out. Um, one of our participants asked, changing, changing topics here a, a little bit, what would be the fastest way to scale grassland carbon? And I assume that means grassland carbon sequestration. So, so pulling that in. Sure. Well, like it or not, I guess we live in a capitalist world. So the, the profit incentive um, is certainly driving the restoration of grasslands right now. There have been some very exciting developments, uh, even just in the last year or so. Uh, large companies, again, love them or hate them, um, but Shell Oil, for example, um, McDonald's, um, General Mills, uh, and just this past October, Apple Computer announced a land restoration project uh, in Africa involving grazing as well. So a number of big players are starting to get involved. Farmers and ranchers, although um, it's only still, a, in, at least in the U.S., a relatively small percentage of the of the market, maybe three to 5%, the estimates vary, are using these more advanced grazing practices. The number is growing because word is getting around uh, for several decades, farmers and ranchers have been adopting these practices, but they've been few in number and there hasn't been that much great science to back it up, but that's begin, begun to change. There are now a number of studies that are coming out and more that will be out just in the next year or so documenting the dramatic improvements that can be achieved with proper grazing. And some of these improvements include increasing the carrying capacity of the land, that is the number of animals the land can support, by a factor of two or three or more. So what that means for a rancher is they can double or triple the size of their herd. It's essentially like doubling or tripling the size of their farm without a ranch, without having to buy any more land. Uh, not only that, uh, the land is becoming um, much more resilient uh, to drought and flooding. Probably one of the better known cases is a farmer in North Dakota named Gabe Brown. Uh, he uh, published a book two years ago now uh, called Dirt to Soil about his experiences 
And as just one example, he was able to increase the rainfall infiltration rate on his soil from one half inch per hour, one half inch of rain, up to eight inches or more per hour, a 16 fold improvement. And what that means for him is anytime it rains now, his neighbor's fields will be completely flooded out. His fields is no flood whatsoever. So when we see these images in the media of the terrible flooding that's happening through the Midwest or in Texas or so forth, look, one of the things to look for is the color of the water that you see in the pictures. And, and it, I can guarantee it won't be blue, it'll be brown. And that's a sign of the land being eroded and just washed away. We're losing all that soil. Um, so by improving soil health, you decrease the erosion, you keep the soil on the land, you improve the profitability of the farmer. Um, so there's great interest in this. And I'll also mention uh, in 2017, National Audubon uh, started a conservation ranching program in response to the decline in the songbird population. Presently, there are more than 2 million acres in the United States that are now part of this program where ranchers are grazing the land in new and improved ways to restore the habitat for the songbirds. You have healthier animals. Uh, you have better environmental ecological outcome verification is one of the names uh, that applies to this, where you look at so many different parameters. Um, I have a, a friend, a researcher, uh, who works uh, with this pro program in particular, and a, a phrase that he's come up with is that, that birds vote with their wings. So birds are a great indicator as to how healthy an ecosystem is, because if it is not to their liking, they can fly away and hopefully find someplace more suitable. So when you see large numbers of birds beginning to move back into a region, it's a very good sign that you're doing something right. Oh, and uh, one other point, through the better grazing, I wanna say, um, I learned growing up, it takes 500 to 1,000 years to form an inch of soil. In fact, if you go to the USDA website, you'll see that today. Uh, obviously, if we're going to form soil as a way of getting the carbon out of the atmosphere, we need to form it. Sometimes they use the word grow, although the geologists uh, don't seem to like that word, but it is a living system. Um, but we need to form the soil absolutely as rapidly as possible. And I've seen a number of circumstances. If, if the viewers have read Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan, he talks about Joel Salatin, who has a farm called Polyface in Virginia. And one of the things that shocked me from reading the book uh, was the account of how Joel Salatin had been able to grow an inch of soil in just a couple of years. So literally 300 times faster than, than what I'd learned was possible. Well, since then, I've learned of other farmers that have gone beyond that, in one case, growing almost a foot of soil in about a decade using proper grazing. So the potential is really outstanding. Now, those growth rates won't continue indefinitely, but it gives an idea of just how quickly we can begin to heal the damage. As a historical footnote, I'll toss in that the estimate of taking a thousand years to form an inch of soil came from Charles Darwin, who in the, I believe the 1880s, toward the end of his life, he and his sons went to Roman ruins in England, and they measured how much soil had formed atop these ruins. And they measured about two inches of soil. They knew the Romans had been there 2,000 years earlier. So it was a pretty easy calculation. And he published that it took 1,000 years to form an inch of soil. And for some reason, that, that number has kind of become locked into the public consciousness as to what the, um, what the number, almost like the speed of light as some sort of uh, bi biological or physical constant. But mm -hmm. thankfully now there are many farmers showing that we're not limited by those constraints and that we can begin to heal soil uh, much more rapidly. Uh, with regard to how to um, motivate these practices or incentivize them even further, there's a great deal of discussion going on uh, about paying farmers and ranchers for providing ecological services. Congresswoman Chelly Pingree uh, from Maine has recently proposed uh, a bill called the Agricultural Resilience, Agricultural Resilience Act, the goal being to make agriculture carbon negative by the year 2040. It will be interesting to watch legislation like that and no doubt other legislation as well uh, to see how things work out. I, I'm not a policy wonk, so uh, others mm -hmm. can do this better than I can. But anyway, those are my thoughts. Great. Thanks, Carl. And we have a request. Um, if you could talk a little bit more about what proper grazing means, what, is, what does that system look like? 
there was a, a, a great paper by Gregory Retallick, who's a paleobotanist, who looked at how the evolution of grasslands over the last 40 or 50 million years helped to cool the planet. And what he realized, and what others, including, I'll mention Alan Savory, if uh, folks have not seen Alan Savory's TED Talk, uh, I would certainly recommend that they do so. Um, I'm honored to say Alan serves on our advisory board. In nature, whenever there were large herds of grazing animals, they would always be kept in a bunch because of predators surrounding them. We can think in North America, the bison, there would always be wolves and coyotes around them. So the bison would never stray off by themselves. When you have all the animals, thousands or tens of thousands of animals grazing in one spot, of course they're urinating, trampling, manuring the ground. No animal likes to feed on, on soiled food. So the herd would constantly keep moving in a search for fresh forage. They would never linger too long in, in one spot. Um, as my colleague Seth uh, came up with the phrase, overgrazing is a human invention. So in nature, we never had overgrazing because of these biological factors. And also in, in the wild and wilderness, uh, the animals would never come back to graze a certain area until enough time had passed to allow um, the, the dung odor, the weathering to get rid of the offensive odors and so forth. And that in turn allowed time for the grasses to grow back again. So uh, back in the 1950s, it was a French scientist, Andre Boisson, who began experimenting. And of course, he wasn't the first. There were some farmers and ranchers I've learned even as late as in the late 1700s realized that it was very unwise to just let your animals out and just fill the pasture and nibble whatever they wanted all season long. Um, one of the worst things that can happen is for a plant to be grazed and then a couple of days later, just as it's starting to grow back again, as the new leaves and the new shoots are starting to come out, for the animal to come along and grab another bite. So what you, you want to prevent that, if at all possible. And you know, for thousands of years, people we've learned have been mismanaging grazing. So, you know, thousands of years ago, we built these walls and barriers to protect our animals from the predators, not realizing that not only were we protecting our animals, but inadvertently, we were also disrupting these exquisitely tuned grazing patterns that had evolved over tens of millions of years. So, based on these breakthrough research by Andre Boisson in the 1950s, and then followed up uh, in the 1970s um, by Alan Savory, uh, we began to understand just how important it is to, to, to replicate, you know, in a form of biomimicry as closely as possible, how grazing occurred in nature. So what many farmers are doing today is they'll take their ranch, they'll subdivide it into 30, sometimes more, 40, 50, as many as 70 or 100 different paddocks, very small grazing places. And you have the animals in each one for maybe a day or two, and then you move them on to the next one and the next one and then the next one every couple of days. So by the time they come back to that original paddock, two, three, four months, possibly as long as a year may have passed. And that allows time for the, the grasses to grow back. Uh, it also interrupts predator cycles and so on. So there are many biological advantages to that. And uh, the trick is in getting the timing exactly right, uh, depending on the, the life cycle of the plant, the life cycle of the animal, depending on what the, the average temperature is, what the rainfall has been like. There were many different factors and parameters to, to come into it. So there's no cookie cutter prescription. You know, there's no exact recipe. The technical name of the, this advanced grazing is called holistic planned grazing. Uh, in the academic literature, it's sometimes referred to as adaptive multi-paddock grazing. Historically, uh, earlier versions of it were called rotational grazing, so that might be a term that people are familiar with, or sometimes it's called mob grazing or management intensive grazing. Uh, but the bottom line is we're trying to replicate nature as closely as possible. Just as a, as a brief tangent, this is very important because worldwide we have approximately 5 billion hectares. And for reference, the United States land area is about a, almost exactly a billion hectares. So we're talking five times the land area of the United States worldwide that are highly degraded grasslands and savannas, savannas being grasslands with trees. And in many cases, these lands look like deserts, but in fact, they receive eight inches, 12 inches, 15 inches of rain or more per year, more than enough to maintain a grassland. 
but because historically they were misgrazed or misfarmed, they've turned to desert, the soils become like sand, it can no longer hold the water. The only way to restore this land, to bring back the fertility and to bring back the wildlife habitat is through beneficial ruminant impact. And because tragically most wild herds have been wiped out, the only option that we have is to use the domesticated livestock that we have. So I'm not talking about a bringing back the cows to land around the world just so we have more cows all around the world, but it is literally to restore the habitat so that the animals we care about, the lions, the tigers, the giraffes, the gi elephants, all of these other anim animals that are facing extinction, we need to be able to restore their habitat so that these animals can thrive. Sorry, it was a long answer. <laughs> oh, no, that's great. And if there are any other questions, feel free to, from the participants, feel free to keep typing them in. Um, one of the things that the, the work that Soil for Climate does in terms of the, you know, the regenerative grazing uh, raises questions around sort of this push in by a lot of people towards veganism or vegetarianism. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about Soil for Climate's position on that or work that you do in terms of education and outreach about the importance of animals as part of, part of a healthy ecosystem. Sure. Personally, it, it doesn't matter to me what someone chooses to eat. In fact, there are some very well-known vegans, uh, David Bronner, for example, the CEO of uh, Dr. Bronner's um, is a vegan, and he speaks very passionately about the need for regenerative grazing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I'm going to walk away from any sort of dividing line like that. I, I, I stand united with vegans absolutely on eliminating industrial animal agriculture keeping animals locked up in these prisons for their entire lives you know, under artificial lights and, and never feeling grass or pasture under their feet is, is criminal to my mind. Um, and, and doubly so because we need the animals to be outside in climate service for humanity. There's uh, been a, a growing body of research. Uh, Dr. Fred Provenza, who's studied animal behavior throughout his career, has written about the, the difference in nutritional value of animals uh, cows in particular that have been finished in these concentrated animal feeding operations, uh, being fed a very sparse diet of a cup, just a couple of plants, maybe su supplemented uh, by some um, mineral supplements or what have you, uh, as compared to cows that spend their lives out on pasture. There's a great example of a, a rancher in, in Idaho uh, named Glenn Elzinger, and his wife is a, a PhD plant uh, physiologist. And she's counted up to 550 different types of plants that his animals are grazing on. So considering that you get you know, something different nutritionally from every different plant out there, his animals are just incredible. Uh, and it should be no surprise that a food critic has labeled you know, his beef the, the best tasting you know, in the country, I, I believe the award was. Um, so the animals are, the healthier the soil, the, the more diversity of plants you have, the healthier the animals, the healthier the people. Uh, it, it just, it, it's important uh, all, all the way around. Uh, certainly if, if people uh, refrain from eating meat, uh, hopefully they're getting the nutrients, the B12 and, and the other minerals that, that, that they need in other ways. Uh, certainly, um, uh, I believe personally, based on the research that I've read, that animal uh, fats and protein are, are very important to the diet. Uh, historically, if we look at the evolutionary record, uh, we can see early humans uh, that was often composed a large part of the diets. Uh, we work with a, a Maasai tribe in Kenya, and historically their diet was comprised solely of, of meat, milk, and blood. And um, the incidence of heart disease, obesity, diabetes, essentially non-existent in these traditional herding communities and they had great longevity. So um, I think uh, I'm not going to prescribe any certain diet. You know, if people mm -hmm. find uh, an approach that works well for them, uh, that's terrific. Uh, certainly if people are buying and consuming grass fed meat, that's healing the environment. They don't need to feel guilty. Like they're doing climate harm. In fact, they're doing a benefit for the climate. Uh, in 2019, General Mills, paid for a life cycle analysis of a farm in Georgia, white oak pastures, and determined that for each pound of regenerative beef that was produced at this farm, approximately a pound of carbon was being pulled out of the atmosphere. 
And by comparison, for every pound of fake meat or plant-based meat, the Impossible Burger, Beyond Burger, uh, that was produced, approximately a pound of carbon dioxide was released into the atmosphere. So although the fake meat products are definitely less destructive to the atmosphere than, than industrial beef, which is so far off the charts, charts bad, um, I think it was at something like 30 pounds of carbon dioxide. I mean, industrial beef is, um, you know, I, I, you know the, the good news is, is that by eating the uh, beef that's been raised properly, we can begin to restore the environment and, and sequester the carbon. And it's really unfortunate that in the media, so often there is no distinction made between industrial beef, which is so destructive to the environment, uh, and regenerative beef. It, we need to raise the profile of beef that's healthy for the land and healthy for the climate and so on. Great. And sort of leading from that, uh, someone asked of, if you could share a little bit of the latest science on climate negative beef. And I think you were just touching on that in terms of the, the carbon that's sequestered from raising that. But I don't know if you want to add any more to that. Sure. Uh, there's, um, in fact, my colleague and I uh, recently put out a, a four page uh, uh, compendium of published studies relative to carbon negative beef, uh, which I'm happy to share. Uh, also at the, uh, the Savory, which is spelled like the herb, Savory Institute. If you Google them and go to their website, they have a pretty comprehensive science library on this. Uh, a couple of papers that I can mention in passing, Teague, uh, Richard Teague uh, in 2016. If you just Google that, uh, you'll find a paper, The Role of Ruminants in uh, Reducing uh, North America's Greenhouse Gases. Uh, there was a paper in 2018 by Paige Stanley and Jason Roundtree uh, documenting that when the grazing was done properly, uh, it becomes carbon negative. Uh, 2015, uh, Megan McMuller put out a paper. These are some of the, the better known studies. There are, there are many more. If anyone wants to contact me afterwards, I'm happy to share my email address. You know, I can put a link in the chat window if anybody wants to grab that. It'll just yeah, and we can share that out as well. When, when I um, send an email around once the recording of this webinar is posted on that same page where the, the recording will be, I can also link out to some of these resources that Carl is mentioning and sharing. Happy to do that. Here's the, um, Great. Here's the link. I'll just copy it and paste yep. it into the chat window if anybody wants to grab that. Wait Great. One moment. Thank you so much. Um, I was just also going to put in a, another plug for Alan Savory's TED Talk. It's, a, it's an excellent introduction to this topic. Thank you, Carl, so much for sharing your, your lunchtime hour with us today as part of International Compost Awareness Week. There's a lot of great information shared in terms of compost and soil health and the connections between soil health and climate change, uh, climate resiliency. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you day. all, everyone.